I'm a lot of fun at parties. Inevitably, when people introduce themselves, the topic of work comes up. I usually answer that I work at Seattle Children's Hospital. I'm a pediatric palliative care provider and work with families of children facing life-threatening or life-limiting illness. My team has expertise in pain and symptom management, complex communication and decision-making, end of life and grief. In these social moments, I tenderly tiptoe around the minefield of emotions that come with talking about what many, even in the medical field, describe as unimaginable, the death of a child. I might occasionally share an anecdote about an anonymous child that has surpassed the expectations of their diagnosis and is out in the world, or an almost Hollywood-like story of the last-minute wedding of a young adult who understands intimately how precious life is. As I'm sure you can imagine, in the setting of a casual get-together or cocktail hour, this conversation, which started out as a relatively innocuous icebreaker, can sometimes change the barometric pressure of the room. This is a part of the human experience that everyone fears that no one wants to talk about. I look into the eyes of individuals who grip their glass a little bit tighter, remembering their hardest goodbye, or look around for their children and allow a brief moment to ponder the what ifs. We usually awkwardly trans transition to something lighter, but occasionally some loosen that grip on their glass and say, that sounds really hard. What led you to this work? In that moment, my life flashes before my eyes. I consider all of the things that led me to question some of my most deeply held beliefs around life and death and what matters most when we know a child is dying. I consider how those changes in me led me to this work. Next, I run through a quick algorithm to decide which aspects of my truth to share. When I was asked to share some thoughts with you, I thumbed through my mental Rolodex of stories, the patients, their families, and my colleagues that have taught me along this journey. There are dozens of stories that push and pull me, that would hit the right note, that have shaped my practice. But in this dialogue where the question isn't only about the role of the professional, but is also about gathering in solidarity to dig into the human experiences at end of life, the child story I feel most compelled to tell is mine. Her name is Mari. In what feels like another lifetime, my sweet and feisty newborn began to lose physical skills, one day rolling over and soon straining to repeat the same motion. Time freezes in my brain and in my body when I recall sitting in an office of a specialist and hearing the words, you should take her home and love her because this diagnosis means just one thing. Mari will not live into adulthood and she will be lucky to live into childhood. I feel the sensation of my heartbeat pounding in my ears, drowning out the words that were said. Instead of our usual commute home, we walk the miles home silently, replaying the words and our own denial over and over again. The picture of our cherubic and engaged now six-month-old baby didn't align with this death sentence. So we worked hard to focus on the life that was in front of us. We celebrated birthdays monthly, knowing there just wouldn't be enough of them. She had her first bites of ice cream far too early. Eventually, early signs of illness creeped in. We noticed panic in Mari each time she was forced to interface with the medical world. During a particularly rough illness, she had to be on a breathing tube to support her failing respiratory system. She wept. She made intense eye contact while tears streamed down her tiny cheeks. The only thing that could temporarily ease her panic was if we brought our faces close enough to her that she could stroke our noses, sometimes for hours. So we hovered over her bed and let her touch our faces and hoped that we could stifle our own cries to not add to the mix of fear-filled tears on her tiny ICU bed. Just a day later, she wriggled her hand free enough to dislodge her tube, whether the medical team was ready or not. She said, all done, over and over. I'll admit that this was a pride-filled moment for me. I thought I had evidence that she was fighting too, that she was fiercely declaring to the world that she was so much stronger than anyone thought. But really, the sad realization dawned on me that she was communicating in a powerful way what took us far too long to realize. We were fighting for the wrong things, 
and our best laid plans removed her voice from the conversation. We paused, we recalibrated, we made a commitment that our desire for her to live couldn't be the only voice we listened to, and that if anyone had to pay the painful price of shouldering this burden, it had to be us. Eventually, a new doctor shared the many years she could live. And then the discussions about tracheostomy, spinal surgeries, painful medical procedures, and a life isolated from peers due to risk of illness followed. When the answer was a firm no, we were asked to meet with a specialist who could hear these questions differently. He introduced himself to me, and this is where I first learned about palliative care. We sat together and he gently explained to me that while medical technology provides opportunities to do everything, some families lovingly choose to intervene less, to be in the hospital less, to reshuffle this predetermined list of priorities and make our own. Many years later, as I navigated my professional pathway as a clinical social worker, I find myself looking around and asking many of the same questions that I wondered to myself as a parent. Is she a diagnosis or a person facing one? I recognize the privilege of having time to come to a place where we were able to hear so loudly what mattered most to Mari, and for us as a family with her palliative care team to translate these wishes into a medical plan. I wanna be clear, I do not believe the choices we made as a family are right for everyone. I tell each family that I meet in this work that if it matters to them, it matters to me. And the work isn't in defining the pathway for each family, but empowering them to listen to their own voices and most importantly, the voices of their children. For some families I meet, like mine, they have been navigating the serious illness of their child for months or years. They've been preparing themselves for the day when someone says a version of their worst fear, your child is dying. For others, a typical day becomes seared into memory forever because of some series of events or what many describe as their living nightmare. In the blink of an eye, their child is changed forever, and the way they interface with the world will never be the same, even when death isn't the outcome. People often think about palliative care as quality time over quantity of time, but we aim to infuse quality of life into every part of the illness and focus on prioritizing the family and their goals holistically. We as a family teetered along the same tension with some hospital stays, but many less, until one cold winter morning upon discharge, Mari said, goodbye, stupid hospital. I'm never coming back here again. I told her that we might have to come back sometime, but that she was insistent that she would never come back again. Another pause, another moment of recalibration, and the support of a team that could empower me to honor her and what she was telling me. So as expected, when another cruel illness weakened her body, we stayed home. I told her the story of the day she was born. Her grandma read her books every evening and her dad snuggled her all night. The same team that met me in that sterile clinic office and told me about palliative care huddled in the living room and provided us with all of the tools to help Mari transition into what came next for her. In a tiny voice on a cold afternoon in January, Mari opened up her bright eyes and said, Mom, I'm gonna be a butterfly and fly into the sky. Won't that be nice? I answered that it sounds nice, that she could fly, and that we would be okay. A day later, she did. So when the grips on those glasses are loosened and we get past the surface into the heart of all of this, it is my greatest honor to hear these tiny voices and speak them loudly into the room. I miss Mari today as much as I did that day and I have some regrets, but answering the call to allow her to speak through me and allowing her to be the guide for her life and death isn't one of them. Thank you. <laughs>